Rosie the Riveter, Civil War Style, a presentation by Walter L. Hall about women in industry in the American Civil War. This presentation is inspired by the work of women in World War II, the Rosie the Riveters, of which my mother, Lucille Hall, was one. She served as a welder building Liberty ships during World War II and worked out at the Kaiser shipyards in Oakland, California. The women serving in industry in the Civil War blazed the trail, blazed the way for women and generations of women to follow. Women of today owe a debt to the women in industry during the Civil War. In this photograph here we see a number of women riveters working on an aircraft and for those of you who are not aware uh, the skin of an aircraft is actually riveted together with what we would call today pop rivets uh, and here you can see a crew of women attaching the skin to an aircraft and these were true riveters on the other hand uh, this is a world war ii liberty ship in this photograph and this ship was also uh, built by women. Uh, these women, though, were welders, and this is what my mother did in World War II. She was a welder assembling these types of Liberty ships. The Liberty ships were about 450 feet long, 56 feet wide, uh, had a cruising range of 20,000 miles, and had a top speed of 13 miles per hour. And quite honestly, a Fast swimming turtle with the tide going in his direction could probably pass one of these Liberty ships. The United States made over 2,200 of these ships during World War II, and we were actually reached a point where we were building these ships faster than the Germans and the Japanese were able to sink them. Comparing the North and the South, their industrialization during the Civil War is like comparing apples and oranges. Northern industrialization is well developed and mature, while southern industrialization is still embryonic. So let's look at some of the caveats here about the Civil War industry. Okay, first is that the North and the South are at vastly different stages of industrial development. Second is that there are vastly different cultural attitudes toward industry in the North than in the South. And there are different impacts on industry from immigration. Factors. Now, let's take a look at this slide here shows the number of factories on the eve of the Civil War, North and South. And as you can see, there were about 110,000 factories located in the North. And the South had only about 17,000 factories. So we have a ratio here of about 5 to 1 with the North ahead. Looking at the regional patterns of manufacturing, and in this we're going to see that the Industrial Revolution was clearly taken roots by 1850, especially in the New England states. And this chart is going to represent the per capita dollar amounts invested by regions and the value of the output from that investment, how much money they made from investing their dollars. The New England states are clearly leading the Industrial Revolution, followed by the middle states of New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Delaware. In the South, in particular the Cotton South, trail far behind. So if you look on this graph or this chart, 1850 in New England, they're investing $57.96 per capita into industry, to manufacturing. In that same time period, that $57 or $58 investment brings them back a return of $100.71. The South, on the other hand, is investing only $7.60 per capita, and they are earning $10.88 off that investment. The Cotton South is even lower, where they're investing only $5.11 per capita. Remember, that's for 100 people. 
and they're making back only six dollars and eighty three cents. So let's take a look now at the cotton exports from 1790 to 1815. And this is going to be actually two things. One, it's the period immediately following the uh, Constitution. And it also includes a period of time here during the War of 1812. So you see a lot of ups and downs on this graph out toward the period of time that covers the War of 1812. But that's not the part of the graph that we're interested in. What I want you to look at there's this little dip here right after 1790. For those of you who uh, attended my presentation on the prelude to the Civil War, and you'll remember our discussion on why the northern states agreed to include slavery in the Constitution. Well, it was because they expected that slavery would die out within 20 years. And you can see from this graph here that uh, despite a small rise in it, it's actually on a decline. And that is until we hit the year 1797. And I'm sure that all of you sitting in the audience tonight know that in 1797, Mr. Eli Whitney created the cotton gym. This revolutionized the production of cotton and made cotton a viable economic uh, uh, product. And you can see from that point on, basically it continues to rise, although it will have periodic uh, falls off due to the economic uh, depressions or recessions. But basically, cotton exports will continue to rise. So let's take a look now at the uh, cotton and just compared with the total exports in the period of 1815 to 1860. And if you had a, a little measuring tool, you could just be interesting to take and measure the gap between total exports, which is a solid top line in this graph, and the dotted line, which is beneath it for the cotton exports. And if you did, if you took that and measured it, you'd notice that for the most part, although there are local changes throughout this, the gap stays fairly consistent. But once you get out here to about 17, 1837, pardon me, 1837, uh, this gap basically starts widening, except in a few cases of economic downturns. And by the time of the evening of the eve of the Civil War, if you look at that, that is a huge gap between total exports and cotton exports. So the question is, is what happened here in 1837? And again, that's a significant thing because that's when the Lowell uh, textile mills and up in New England went into operation, and that's when we started becoming the early part of the Industrial Revolution here in the United States, and when we were starting to become a major exporting nation. Again, cotton exports go up too, but uh, at this point in time, the uh, manufacturing exports are starting to outstrip cotton exports in importance. So what are the factors that are affecting the rise of northern industrialization? And I've identified three here that we're going to look at tonight. And the first of these is the culture, northern culture. Technology that we will see in the north. And then lastly, immigration. So let's go and explore these one at a time, okay, and in a little more depth. Concerning northern culture, the north is going to see itself as a region of progress, activity, and action. And it sees the south as an aristocratic medieval region of evil slave owners. Where does this perception come from? Uh, in large part, it comes from a book called uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And that's going to be the perception of the South that most Northerners will have, that portrayed in Uncle Tom's cabin. Well, how does the South look at this? Okay, in Southern culture, the South sees itself as honorable, noble followers of the code of chivalry. They see the North as corrupt, full of immigrants, urban, pasty white mechanics, people without honor, and wage slaves. And this is going to be reinforced in part by a poem written by a southerner, and 
I'm only going to quote a, a few lines of this. Uh, actually, the poem is quite long. It's probably a thousand lines or more. And this poem was written in 1856, uh, and it's titled The Hireling and the Slave. And it's written by William Grayson of Charleston, South Carolina. And in this poem, he is comparing the better life of the Negro slave to that of the white wage slave of the North. So here we go. The Hireling. Free but in name, the slaves of endless toil, a squalid hut, a kennel for the poor, our noisome cellar stretched upon the floor, his clothing rags, the filthy straw, his bed, with offal from the gutter daily fed. These are the miseries, such the wants, the cares, the bliss that freedom for the servant appears. Now, if you look at Uncle Tom's cabin, and you look at this poem, The Hireling, there is a certain amount of truth in each one of these. Were there slave owners who treated their slaves badly? There certainly were. Were there people, industrial workers in the North who lived very much like the hireling that's described here? Yes, there were. So there's a, a, an element of truth in each one of these uh, statements. In fact, both of them probably represent excellent use of propaganda, you know, taking a little bit of truth and magnifying it here. So let's move on now. We, we've kind of discussed the culture here of how each one of these groups of people or these regions of the country view each other. Let's look now at technology. <clears throat> in this, you see a photograph here of a mechanics toolbox in the early 1800s. And specifically note the precision measuring tools which allow the northern mechanics to develop precision machines that made other machines for manufacturing. This is key. This is called the American system of manufacturing. In this country, we will make machines that make machines that will manufacture for us. So, and if you look to the, uh, the drawer that is out and just to the left of that a little bit, you'll see a number of calipers. Uh, elsewhere in there, you should see a micrometer. Uh, the compass, the number of precision measuring tools which the United States, which are used in the United States, but more frequently used in the North. Our next photograph here shows a micrometer. It says number one. Uh, presumably, this is the first micrometer. Uh, maybe that makes it too easy for us. But the information that came with this photograph said. It was one of the first micrometers, and it was probably built in the uh, 1790s to early 1800s. And it was used for making, for the precision manufacturing of tools, making tools. Again, the American system of manufacturing. Now, I have to say that for the most part, these things tend to be concentrated more in the New England area. Are there mechanics in the South? Yes, there are. Quite frequently, these were people who were brought down from the north and used for specific jobs or under contract. Uh, there were not many southerners who took up this as a trade. So let's take a look now at the role of immigration in this. And we're going to look at three different things here with immigration. First of these is going to be the overall rise in immigration. Then uh, the immigration by specialty. And then we're going to look at uh, two specific uh, waves of immigration. Those are the Irish and the Germans. Okay. This table here is, reflects the totals by year or by decade, basically, of immigrants to the United States between 1820 and 1880. And if you notice in, in the uh, decade of the 1820s, 152,000 people came to the United States. <clears throat> that number tripled in the decade of the 1830s. And that number tripled again in the decade of the 1840s, just 1.7 million. In the decade of the 1850s, that number basically doubles. And in the decade of the 1860s, that number levels off and actually drops slightly. Drops from 2.5 million down to 2.3 million. 
And that's easily explained by the presence of the Civil War for a number of the years during that decade. And what person would want to immigrate to another country that's having a civil war in progress? Of equal interest to the numbers of immigrants are going to be the immigration by labor specialty. And we've identified four groups of people that we're looking at, laborers, merchants, farmers, and weavers. And I'll start from the bottom of the list and work upward. Okay, Weavers, uh, up until about 1830, there were 2,900 weavers that came into the country. Between 1830 and 1840, that number jumps up to 6,600. Uh, in the next decade, it drops down to 1,300. And in the decade of the 1850s, it drops down to under 1,000. So it peaks early on, and it basically dies out, and overall has relatively little impact. So what's, what's going on here, okay? Well, in the decade of the 1830s, particularly 1837, you're going to see the implementation of the Lowell Mills in Massachusetts and at uh, New Manchester. By that time, we start turning out, we've, we've brought in a lot of weavers, but at that point in time, in the last three years of that decade, we start producing our own weavers. We don't need to import weavers from Europe anymore. And that number will slowly uh, dwindle. The other major group we're looking at here, of course, are farmers. Uh, 15,000 in the first 30 years of the century jumps up to 88,000. By uh, the 1840s, it's up to 256,000. And in the decade just before the Civil War, it's up to 404,000. Continuously growing. And the interesting thing is, most of these farmers arrive in this country with some money in their pocket. One of the first things that they do is they head west. They want to move to the Ohio Valley to... Uh, oh... The old Northwest Territories, and they're helped in these efforts by the fact that uh, there's cheap land available for farmers. The federal government, one of the ways that it raises money is it has all this land that it owns and it sells it off and it sells it off fairly cheaply. A lot of this land has been sold in large blocks to uh, uh, middle middlemen. Uh, the government's not in the business of financing these loans, but these middlemen are. So it's, it's fairly easy for farmers to be able to purchase adequate land and to still have some money in their pocket to get started. Third group of importance are the merchants. And again, you can see the numbers basically go up over the years. They, they never reach the number of the farmers or the uh, laborers, but there's a steady increase in merchants throughout the country. And merchants usually arrive in this country with money in their pocket. I mean, what is, what's one of the things you do as a merchant? You buy things. You sell things. So to buy and to sell, you have to have money. So as soon as the merchants usually arrive in this country, they too head west. They head down uh, to the Ohio Valley. They head to the old Northwest Territories, down to the Mississippi uh, Basin, and they spread out and they go into business. They do not stay around the places where they first land. So that leaves us this last group, and it's the largest, and that's going to be the laborers. And you can see that grows fairly steadily, in fact, by leaps and bounds. Between the 1830s, uh, 53,000 people. In the next decade, there are going to be 281,000 people, and we'll, we'll explain why in a moment. By 1851, there are over a half a million people coming into the country in that decade. The laborers, are unlike the merchants and the farmers, arrive here dead broke. They have no money. And the place that they land at in this country, usually Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, that's where they stay. They have no money to move further than that. So they're stuck there, and these large populations of people will accumulate. Many of them will end up being uh, factory workers. Many of them will end up being unemployed. Many of them will end up being uh, 
well, just trying to get by in life. So, so let's let's switch on over now and look at the, the two major groups of immigrants to this country. And the first we're going to look at is the Irish immigrants. And you notice in the last slide there, the large number of them that came in the decade of the 1840s. Well, that was due to a failed potato crop in Ireland in which about 2 million Irishmen died. It's going to be the largest group of immigrants, especially between 1830 and 40. They arrive in the northeast coast cities and they stay. They're too poor to move on. And you still see this in the demographics along the east coast. Um, Boston has a large population of uh, Irish that started back in these times. There are a large number of Irishmen in New York City. And so that's, that's where these large populations come from. About 2 million arrived between 1830 and 1860. And all these people, these Irishmen, face discrimination for two reasons. One, they're Catholic and they are poor. Uh, today we are much more open to different religions and stuff, but back in the 1800s there was a, a fierce dislike of Catholics. And it was referred to as popism, and it actually uh, changed even some of the major political parties at the time. There were smaller political parties that rose up in opposition to Catholics and things. So. They were not a popular group of people. They were hated by Protestants as wage-depressing competitors. Uh, if you were a white Protestant living in this country, the last thing you wanted to do was have a few Irishmen in your neighborhood because they would work for less money than you did. And I'd like to point out that a good example of some of this dislike between the workers and the free blacks can be seen the dock workers in New York City, the blacks and the Irish, there were a number of race riots uh, even before the Civil War, or leading up to the Civil War. But the movie, The Gangs of New York City, are focused on the draft riots of 1863, in which the Irish were essentially in a rebellion or out of control there. And the federal regiments were dispatched from the battlefield at Gettysburg to New York City, where they mowed down the Irish rioters. Where only one week earlier, they had been mowing down Confederates and Pickett's charge. And believe it or not, same troops firing the same rifles at the Irish that they had fired at the Confederates. The other major group of immigrants were the German immigrants. There were one and a half million come between 1830 and 1860. Most of the uh, German immigrants immediately moved west. They moved to St. Louis, to Cincinnati, to Cleveland. Most of the Germans arrive with money in their pocket to buy farms. And remember, farms are cheaper to buy in those days. Uh, most of the Germans that arrive in this country are better educated than the frontier Americans. For instance, most of them, nearly all of them, can read, write, and do math. Uh, all of them, the German uh, immigrants, strongly support public schools. And one of the schools they support is called a kindergarten. And we still have kindergartens today, compliments of the German immigrants. They also introduced beer on a large scale. It had always been beer, but the Germans made it more popular. And then finally, the uh, Germans happened to be a severe setback both to uh, organized religion other than maybe the Lutherans and the uh, temperance movement, because not only do they drink beer, they drink it on Sundays. Heaven forbid to have a beer on a Sunday. So now that we've cleared out some of this kind of background information that's necessary about you know industries leading up to the Civil War, let's take a look at the early role of women in the war. Okay. First of all, there is a general expansion of industry to meet the war needs. And we're going to talk more about each one of these separately, so I'll move on to the next one. Uh, women will replace male workers called to military duty. And then the third point is that most of these jobs are going to be temporary in nature. So, 
With the general expansion of industry to meet the war needs, that's because wars create more demand for more goods. It's if uh, you simply, they might have gotten through with the number of, of workers, uh, male workers, that there wasn't this huge expansion, but you're going to have to expand factories to produce more rifles, and more munitions, more clothing, more foodstuffs, more transportation workers. So it's a general widening of the industry itself. As a part of this widening, of course, male workers are called into military duty and quite often where they can, female workers will replace them. And the temporary nature of this is that what happens frequently after wars, and I know uh, there are probably not that many, no one in the audience possibly except maybe Harris Young, but after the wars, when the men, the armies are demobilizing and the men are returning home, they come home to claim the jobs that they had before the war, and therefore the women that had these jobs are usually let go. What has happened here, though, is that having entered the job market, women entering the job market, they're obviously, their obvious quality has been seen, and a, after a short time after the war, women are quickly drawn back into the workforce. So, it's only a temporary setback. What are the types of labor that women will perform in the war? Well, let's see. First of all, government civil service workers, munitions manufacturing, the textile industry, got to have those uniforms for the troops, nursing, take care of those injured on the battlefield, and what I call miscellaneous industrial work, which can be anything from uh, telegraphers to uh, school teachers and an assortment of other things. At that particular time, the Census Bureau had a listing of 300 job classifications. And out of these 300 job classifications, during the Civil War, women can be found in all but 67 fields of work. So they were pretty much doing almost everything. Uh, Unfortunately, my source didn't give me an example of the ones that they weren't doing, but I would imagine maybe coal mining and things like that. So we'll start by taking a look at the women in the munitions manufacturing industries. Like World War II, this is the glamour industry. Uh, it, and we have here a photograph of women at work in a munitions factory. And there are a couple features here I'd like to point out to you. First, of course, is notice that uh, they have these long dresses on and these bustles and everything. Uh, not the safest type of clothing to wear into a place like that, because up on this table they're going to be, looks like they're probably making cartridges here, and one of the things they're going to do is being ladling and pouring gunpowder into some paper cylinders, which we'll talk about in a minute. There will be loose gunpowder all over, um, not the safest thing to do because if they were, we'll, we'll cover that in a minute. I'm also interested in the officer here. Uh, a little hard to tell, but it, he may have a shoulder strap on, which would indicate he is a federal officer, but the hat is that of a Confederate naval officer. So I'm a little confused as to the precise origins of the photo, and the person who gave it to me was, couldn't, couldn't, um, provide that information either. So let's look at loading the rifle to musket. I'm sure many of you in the audience here have seen these uh, mini balls. Notice how they are hollow on the end. They have some little uh, bands around there. This means when the bullet is fired, the uh, hot gases go up into that little concave area, expand that out, it fills the barrel, forcing the bullet out of there higher pressure, which gives it a greater range and a greater accuracy. And these particular mini balls were used in a, what would be called the 1861 Springfield rifle. And this was one of the more common weapons used in the Civil War. There were actually about 75 different rifles used during the Civil War. 
But this is one of the more common. It was manufactured uh, at the Springfield, Massachusetts uh, Arsenal. They manufactured 900,000 of these rifles, and another 800,000 were made by contractors. The Confederates used the same rifle, picking it up off the battlefield, or they primarily used the British infield rifle, which would have been very similar. And here is a, uh, uh, a drawing of a mini ball cartridge. This cartridge was manufactured by taking a wooden dowel, a little piece of wood that was round to the right size there, and taking three sheets of paper and wrapping those three sheets of paper around that ball so that you ended up with a flat surface on the bottom of it. This one may doesn't look flat. Um, you would then take and drop the bullet down the bottom of that and then take a ladle or some other device and put in the appropriate amount of black powder give this thing a twist around the top to seal it and uh, tie the top with a small string the small fingers of women did this type of work much better than men did but in the process of doing this, you can imagine in pouring this gunpowder down there, there's going to be a fair amount of spillage. Presumably it was scooped up and used and consolidated and used in other bullets. But there's still going to be loose gunpowder all around. Which brings us to the one of the key elements here of uh, munitions manufacturing, and that is going to be industrial safety. Industrial safety is not a major concern prior to the labor unionization movement. Before unions, uh, factory owners could care less about uh, safety. They had no reason to, and uh, if a worker was killed or disabled on Wednesday, his replacement would be to work on Monday morning. It was that simple. And there were no penalties. There was no OSHA to make sure that standards were enforced. No state organizations that enforce safety. It just was what it was. Munitions plants, when operated in compliance with rules, could be safe. And there were people who did try to operate these plants safely. And we're going to look at one of those uh, plants. But, uh, you know, there was no government requirement. Uh, you couldn't really sue a plant owner. That was just assumed that that was a condition and you assume that risk when you went to work there. So we're going to compare two factories, the Allegheny Munitions Arsenal at Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania, and the Augusta Powder Plant at Augusta, Georgia. So we'll start with the uh, Allegheny Plant first. Uh, here's a kind of a slide that shows the number of deaths at selected arsenals. And these are single accident events. Uh, the Allegheny Arsenal, for instance, in one incident lost 78 workers, uh, nearly all of them women, many of them children as young as 10 years old. Uh, that was a federal arsenal. The other one was a Washington Arsenal in Washington, D.C., where there were 21 workers killed, again, nearly all of them women, and they're buried there in Washington, D.C., and it seems to me Fairly recently, in the last couple of years, there was some type of a ceremony at the uh, mass grave of these workers. The other, looking at it from the southern side, because the southerners were not immune from accidents either. And the Richmond Arsenal, primary Confederate arsenal, had an incident with 50 people killed. And we're going to compare this with the Augusta Arsenal, also a Confederate arsenal, which had only eight people killed. And was probably one of the safest uh, arsenals operated in the country on either side. This is a photograph here of the Allegheny Arsenal, the buildings that were there. I'm sure back in the day, this uh, white concrete area there didn't exist. That was probably mud and dirt. And uh, they had these little walkways that connected the buildings one to the other. This, the fact that that would have been dirt would have actually been a safety thing because uh, 
there's a lot of spillage of gunpowder uh, landing on the ground like that. Uh, the ground tends to hold moisture and would eventually uh, wet the gunpowder and, and make it uh, ineffective. The Allegheny Arsenal was built in 1814. It manufactured cartridges for rifles and cannons. Employed over 1,100 workers, nearly all of them female. There are going to be a few men there, but most are females. And most of, many of these females will be as young as 10 years old. The plant superintendent, a man named Mr. McBride, had recently fired all the young boys from the arsenal because they smoked cigarettes and would, in his estimation, have a tendency to sneak off and have a smoke and that was not what he wanted going on in the arsenal. So, the Allegheny incident or accident occurred on uh, Wednesday, September the 17th of 1862, and about 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Wednesdays was payday, and the arsenal had one had three army officers assigned to it. One uh, colonel, Colonel Simonton, and then had two second lieutenants, both recent graduates from uh, West Point. And one of these graduates, each payday, would uh, go off to a side building, and then the women would be called over in small groups and paid their wages. There's going to be three major explosions. These are going to kill 78 employees, most of them women and children. And as a result of this, there are going to be 54 bodies that are unidentified and buried in a mass grave at the Allegheny Cemetery. That's where they recovered the body. There are bodies that were never recovered. But since these were unknown, you can't tell. In a number of incidences inside the rooms where these explosions took place, you would find three hoops from a hoop skirt. The large outer one, the middle one, and then the smallest. Three rings lying there. Nothing left of the woman who had worn those skirts. The intense heat generated by these explosions totally incinerated their bodies. In a, in a moment, they were just converted into uh, a vapor. And three rings from there being metal, they fell down and were sitting there still. And a number of these were found. So the, those bodies, of course, were never recovered. In no way of ever telling who wore those hoops. The explosions uh, certainly blew human flesh all over the place. Pieces and parts of bodies were found all around. Uh, small pieces of flesh were found on tree limbs, clothesline poles, uh, buildings, and Eventually, not too long after the explosion, people started coming down from Philadelphia and from Pittsburgh to see the site of this explosion. And as a memento of this explosion, they would take away these little pieces of human tissue. I have no idea what they would do with that. And sometimes when I think how the degree of sick people we have wandering around today, I, I use this to remind myself that I guess that we've always had sick people. Okay, was this explosion investigated? Well, actually, no, it wasn't. Not initially. The townspeople wait, because remember, this is mostly their friends and their relatives who've been killed. And they're waiting on an explanation of this from the Army. And the Army, which operates this thing, the, the Department of Ordnance, the Ordnance Department, does nothing from their point of view. When Monday comes, we'll reopen the plant and keep in business. And in point of fact, that's what happened. Remember, the explosion was on Wednesday. Uh, that gives them uh, Thursday and Friday to take care of things, have the funerals. And on Monday morning, the plant reopened in full production. So the Army has no concerns about this. So finally, a local coroner's injury of seven men is impaneled on September the 29th. They investigate the accident and they find that Colonel Symington, Lieutenants Eddy and Myers 
the superintendent McBride are guilty of neglect causing the accident. So, uh, get ahead of myself here a little bit, okay? No, I'll say by the outline. Uh, the Army, of course, can't can't bear the thought of this, uh, you know, the, the civilians doing the investigation. So they convene a court of inquiry. The court of inquiry clears Colonel Simonton, Lieutenant Eddie, Eddie and Myers, and Superintendent McBride of any fault for the accident. And they also are unable to come up with a cause of the accident. And that's where the entire thing dies. Colonel Symington officially is left in command, but he is recalled to Washington, D.C. And about six or eight months later, will die in Washington, D.C. Lieutenant uh, Eddie ends up uh, a year or two later dying in an insane asylum. Uh, it's not said how much this accident had to do with his dying or being insane, but you can draw your own conclusions on that one. And Lieutenant Myers uh, is probably the only one who comes out of this with uh, his tail feathers intact. And he goes west and is attached to, as an aide to one of the Western uh, Union generals. Superintendent McBride, I guess, still stays here in charge of the plant with whoever replaces Symington and Lieutenant Eddie and Myers. Now, I would point out that Superintendent McBride had a daughter who was 14 years old. And his daughter was one of the workers that was killed in this accident. As the plant superintendent, he had complained numerous times about the quality of the barrels being supplied by DuPont Incorporated, in which the amium, the black powder was transported. So that there were loose staves in the barrel and the barrel heads were not secure. And this allowed the gunpowder to leak out. You would, the gunpowder would come in on a train. It would be rolled off of some way or another, placed on wagons, transported up to the arsenal for use. That when it arrived at the arsenal, it would then be stored in buildings until needed. And then when one of these smaller buildings where they're making cartridges needed uh, more gunpowder, then they would simply roll this barrel out and possibly even just roll it up to the building. Again, leaving a trail of gunpowder. I would point out to you that uh, this is the DuPont chemical company that we all know and love today. And for those of you who don't know, DuPont was, of course, a major supplier of bombs in Vietnam and other munitions that still do. So they're still in business, presumably doing better. They also make lots of other things. They're basically in the chemical industry and explosions. Explosives are the form of a chemical. Moving on now to the Augusta, Georgia Powder Works. And the photograph you're looking at here is the surviving building of the Augusta Powder Plant. And there were 26 buildings that made up this uh, powder plant, and this is the only one surviving to today. The others have all been torn down and have disappeared. But these series of buildings were the only permanent buildings ever built by the Confederate States government. They occupied buildings, they leased buildings, they captured buildings, but this is the only one that the Confederate government set out to build from scratch. Now, I'll point out two things. First of all, that the tall obelisk there in front, it actually serves no purpose. It serves no purpose now, and even in the Civil War, it served no purpose. Uh, seems to me a lot of time and effort went into making something that served no purpose. And then the second thing is this uh, Gothic uh, frontage to this building is modeled on that of the uh, British Parliament. So. And again, just to summarize, it's a complex of 26 buildings, includes refineries, laboratories, rolling mills, test ranges. By the end of the war, the gunpowder produced at this plant surpasses Europe's best facilities to produce arguably the finest grade of gunpowder in the world. So 
So let's look a little more here at this. Uh, like I said, they are the only permanent building built by the Confederate States of America. During its lifetime, this facility will produce about 7,000 pounds of gunpowder per day. And the final total, it built 2,750,000 pounds of gunpowder. And then finally, uh, it produced enough gunpowder to meet uh, the entire needs of the Confederate States armies. Uh, there were other gunpowder mills. So, but this one, uh, you know, if this had been the only plant that the South had had, it still produced enough gunpowder to meet the needs of the Confederates in the Civil War. I would point out that no Confederate army ever lost a battle due to a lack of ammunition and gunpowder. Okay, there may have been local events where you know the gun, the gunpowder might be needed here and was over there. For instance, uh, we all know at Gettysburg, uh, somebody sent the reserve supply of ammunition away. Uh, but those were local events. The army itself still had plenty of gunpowder. And on the day that the colonel commanding this arsenal put the padlock on the door and walked away, there were still 70,000 pounds of gunpowder sitting in the front. So let's look at a little bit here at uh, the Augusta Powder Works and how it was built. This one was built, as I said, from scratch. Uh, actually, there were some designs from the... Uh, available to the Confederacy for munitions buildings and plants from Europe and these were used in constructing this one and so as customary for gunpowder mills the buildings were separated and designed to survive explosions so separated each building had there was a distance of 200 feet between it and another building one of the parts of the design to survive was at the roofs were made very flimsy. Uh, if inside these buildings, if you had an explosion, you wanted the force of the explosion to go up into the air. You did not want to contain the explosion within the building and have it blow out the walls laterally. You wanted it to go vertical. And to help keep these explosions within the building, should they occur, uh, it had 20 foot thick walls. Uh, basically an outer wall and inner wall and the inner part filled with uh, stones and uh, dirt. So these were, it was pretty well made and that might contribute to the fact that it uh, had very few people killed and no major accidents. The raw materials, they would start at one end of this plant. They were refined and ground with five ton wheels and then the finished powder would be loaded loaded a mile and a half down the line. The Salt Peter Refinery Building was the largest and was designed in the Gothic style as a replica of the British House of Parliament and that was a building we saw here at one of the slides on the Augusta Powder Plant. Let's kind of take a look now here at uh, the Schofield Iron Works located in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And this is a before picture, and not that it's necessarily a part of this, but if you kind of look real close, uh, that to me looks like a woman, at least one woman in there. It's kind of hard to tell. It's a very grainy photograph, but maybe a woman there, but that's not the point of the photograph. The point of the photograph is this is what the Iron Works look like before and now we're going to show you an after photograph okay this is the ironworks after and your question might be after what <laughs> after a meteorite hit the plant well almost this this photo is taken at the site of the previous photo and it shows the effect of 80 carloads of ammunition blowing up Remember, this is in Atlanta, Georgia. Hood's reserve supply of ammunition is loaded on 80 car loads. Several days before, and, and Hood's aware he's going to have to evacuate Atlanta, he asks his chief of staff to make sure that he gets his ammunition out of town. But, uh, well, the chief of staff doesn't do this. Eventually, a court of inquiry is uh, 
convened to see that it's his fault because this ammunition has to be blown up in place. I'm not going to leave it for the Union Army. And the Chief of Staff is the one who takes the blame for this event. My personal opinion is it is the fault of General Hood. General Hood's headquarters was only a few blocks away from this site. And at any moment, every day, he had to get into his horse. He had to be lifted onto his horse. And as he rode around the town, he had to obviously see that the ammunition was still sitting there. And why did he not say to his chief of staff, why haven't you done as I have told you to do? Um, and the other reason I blame him is I like the uh, Truman Doctrine. The buck stops here. And uh, Hood had no problem blaming us on somebody else. As you'll see later on in, in other, for instance, in the presentation I do on the Battle of Franklin, Hood has no problem blaming other people for lots of other things that are quite often his own fault. But the point of this photograph is that within 30 days after this explosion, the women of the South working in these manufacturing plants had completely replaced that 80 cars of ammunition. Remember, that's the reserve supply. They still supplied the regular supply of ammunition. So I think that's an amazing tribute to the women of the South that they could make up for Hood's mistake so quickly. He didn't deserve such good service as he got out of that. Now let's move on. Uh, we've covered the munitions operators. Let's take a look now at telegraph operators. And here you see a uh, replica of an 1863 code key. And interpretive straight lever key is called and I include these telegraph operators because I have an affection for them my grandfather was a telegrapher in the uh, 1880s and 90s and therefore I have a strong like of telegraphers he was a telegrapher at what is now Orlando Florida I have in my possession a letter written from him in the 1880s or 90s, in which he states he has not seen another human being for over a week that was not on a train passing through his radio, his uh, telegraph station. You can imagine today there are several hundred thousand visitors per day in a place that he had not seen anyone for a week. Okay, we'll look first at Southern Telegraph Operators. And I have to tell you, not a whole lot of stories about them survive. Uh, I'm convinced there is a whole lot of information on things like this that is out there in uh, letters and uh, diaries and journals uh, and papers. And my big regret is that, you know, after the Civil War, we produced the official records of the Civil War. It includes a lot of the records of the war. But you know, since that time, many, many other things have been discovered, and there's no systematic way of organizing them like there was with the official records. So there's probably stuff out there, we just don't know where it is. Southern telegraphy is not federalized, as in the North. Lincoln would uh, federalize them. And this, so that leaves two companies in the South that operate the telegraph system. And in many of these companies, just like in the North, Southern women will replace male telegraph operators. Now, this part about the two companies is key because the fact that the Confederacy did not nationalize their telegraphs, their communication systems, many people, many of these telegraph operators in small stations, give them the choice between sending a paid telegraph, telegram for the customer, buy some corn or something like that, who paid to send that telegram, his goes ahead of maybe an important uh, government telegram. Like, I am surrounded, I desperately need men or ammunition at this point. That's the disadvantage of having a non-national system. So, in the north, uh, the telegraph system, along with the railroads, is going to be nationalized, comes under federal control. And while the federal government in most places never actually 
operated the uh, the telegraph or the railroads, especially places distant behind the lines. Uh, there were important lines that they did more tightly control, and uh, they did uh, make sure that their telegrams went first. Telegraphy is more developed in the north. Remember, for the most part, telegram, telegraph lines go along the railroads, and uh, the north simply had three or four times as many railroads as the south, so they had many more uh, miles of telegraph wire and touching more towns and in the south, and therefore they had a greater need for operators. The problem that they ran into in the north was that in many of these small towns there wasn't enough telegraph traffic to uh, pay an operator full salary. And they got around this by uh, hiring women who would work for less. And if you've ever seen pictures of the early uh, telephone exchanges, quite often those were in somebody's house, especially very early on, where they could, it was just kind of a, you know, the wife, woman could be in there cooking dinner. She could hear in the other room a phone call being made and run in there and make the connections and then go back to fix some dinner. Volume was low. Uh, and that seemed to work out. Well, a lot of times that's the way it worked with these telegraph operators. Uh, the station might be there in someone's home. And again, women can be hired for less money than men. And a typical example is this Helen N. Plummer who became an operator for the Area and Michigan Telegraph Company. In about 1850, her starting fast salary is $125 a year. And you divide that by 12, and that's making $10 a month. I want to take a look here at uh, this young lady. This is uh, Her name is Louisa Volker. She is a St. Louis telegraph operator. The first military telegraph operator, female military operator, west of the Mississippi. And she becomes a member of the uh, Federal Military Telegraph Corps of the Union Army. Probably volunteered since they couldn't draft her. And she was accepted due to the shortage of military telegraph operators in the area. She uh, worked out at Mineral Point, Missouri. And uh, for those of you who are interested in the Missouri Civil War history, of course, that was an area of active military operations at Mineral Point and at uh, oh, trying to think, Pilot Knob. Okay, those those are some Civil War names of battles, and she was actually in there in Pilot Knob, I believe, when the Confederate cavalry came in there. So, one of the lady heroes right there, kind of on the very front lines of uh, telegraphy and military communications. And her transmissions were very important to the Union Army at that the Confederate operations around there. I'm going to skip over these next people. Uh, this is uh, Elizabeth Cogley and uh, Emma Hunt and Hetty Ogle. And Abby Strubble, because we simply don't have time. We're going to move on to the textile work. But it's important to recognize the work of the uh, telegraph operators in the Civil War. Okay. The largest group of uh, women in the Civil War working in the industry are going to be in the textile industries. And here we have a photograph of a child worker, I'm, I'm guessing, looking at her, probably 15, maybe 16. And I want to point out a couple of things in this photograph. First of all, uh, notice that dress that she is wearing. One, she's got on a little apron in the front of her. Uh, but it's up above her ankles. It's short. Notice that she has no bustle on. This is a much safer set of clothing than we saw the women in that earlier photograph saw so sitting there loading cartridges, wearing these really long dresses that drag the floor and scooping up black powder. 
and uh, the bustles that would uh, eventually catch on fire. The other thing I'd like to point out is, uh, of course, in these days, the ASA film speeds were very low, probably on ASA of 50 or less. So, in taking a photograph like this, the film speed would have been very slow, and it shows up the motion of this thing here turning and spinning. Okay, you can see it obviously it looks like it is a wheel in motion. Next item we're looking at here is called the Lowell Offerings. And this goes back to the Lowell Mills in Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, which would have been similar to the mills in New Manchester. And these mills went into operation in about 1837. And they employed young women, young New England women, from primarily from Puritan farms. Okay? Well, these Puritan farmers were not likely to give up their daughters to go and live in Gotham City of sin and stuff. They wanted to make sure that their daughters were in a healthy environment, healthy morally, spiritually, uh, as well as physically. So the Lowell Mills... When they were constructed, they built residences there, boarding houses. And each one of these boarding houses was operated by an older woman, a matron, who was on the payroll for the salary of uh, the mills. And these girls would, uh, when they would accept a job there, they would go and live in one of these boarding houses. They had to pay for that, a dollar and fifty cents a week out of their wages. And they were given uh, a room, a bed, probably not a private room, they were probably a I don't know, no idea how many women slept in the same room, but, you know, they were, they were given a bed and they were given their meals. These boarding houses, uh, I have to say that these jobs in Lowell, Massachusetts were some of the first to come with company health care benefits. Whoa, 1837 health care benefits. Okay, well, the benefit was not terribly great. It was a benefit, and that was a free Smallpox shot. The company would pay for your smallpox immunization because the last thing they wanted was all these people crowded together in close living quarters to have smallpox go through them real fast. The other thing that these uh, companies provided, it was provided at these boarding houses, was a separate room for the sick. If a girl was obviously uh, ill and likely to be contagious, the matron of the uh, boarding house, of course, would notify her supervisor, but she would also move her into this private room that she would occupy during the period of time that she was sick so that she did not contaminate the entire workforce. Here are several of the girls that work at the Lowell Mills. Now, I would also say that... Uh, the Lowell Mills, and, and these are available actually on the internet, um, had a series of very strict rules that were used at these plants, these factories, and one of the rules was no smoking on company grounds. So once you entered the uh, factory grounds, you were not allowed to smoke pipe cigar, cigarettes, whatever. The reason was simple. Uh, cotton would arrive from the south, would go in the, the lower level of these buildings, and it would be processed. But in the process of processing, <laughs> there was lots of cotton dust. Cotton dust covered everything. Cotton dust would eventually cover the girls by the end of the day, depending on where they were. Cotton dust would be everywhere, and it was, of course, highly flammable. So one of the rules was no smoking, no open fires in these buildings. This next photograph is a recruitment poster. This particular company here in Lowell, uh, they're recruiting for 75 young women, 15 to 35 years of age, and they're more likely to get them 15 years old. And as a matter of fact, uh, the 15 is not even a good solid bottom number. They would take them as low as 10 years old. There's always something a child can do in those plants. And here's a photograph of the 
mills here in Lowell. And I want you to kind of remember what these buildings look like, okay? Because we're going to look at some in a little while down in Roswell, Georgia, and down in New Manchester, Georgia. And you're going to look at the similarities between them. But I like this photograph because if you look down front here, the man standing by the tree, there is a dog there. almost looks like it's probably a poodle since it's got kind of that fluffy tail on the end. And then over by the man on horseback, there's a dog laying there next to the horse. I'm a dog person, so people can't be all bad if they have dogs. This is uh, the Roswell Mills uh, down in Roswell, Georgia. It's just off of Interstate 75, uh, maybe 15 or 20 miles northwest of uh, uh, northeast, I guess, of Atlanta. And these mills were built in 1837 also, interestingly enough. And these were built by a man named Roswell King. <coughs> Roswell King came over here uh, somewhat before that, along with a, a very distant multiple cousin back of mine named uh, Stephen Bullock. And they were out here looking for a place to build another town. Bullock had his own reasons for wanting to leave Savannah. Uh, and Roswell King was looking for a place to build up. And his intent in building this, these mills at Roswell, Georgia, was that these would not be operated by slaves, that these mills would offer employment to young, single, white women for whom there was not many employment operations in the uh, antebellum south. And you can see here, just kind of look the similarity, similarity there of that building. There were five buildings like this in Roswell, and uh, these will be burned when Sherman's troops come through there in 1864. I have an excellent presentation on that that you should hear sometime. Sherman's March was it a war crime. Here's a photograph of the mill, one of the mills at uh, New Manchester, Georgia, which is uh, only about five or ten miles away from Roswell. And if you look at that, again, you can see the similarity to that building, although most of it's burned out. This also was burned down by Sherman in uh, 1864. But I find this photograph interesting. First of all, it's a high angle shot from a helicopter or an airplane. Now look at how desolate the land around there looks. I don't know what caused that. I have been passing through the area, asked about the possibility of going up to this building and been told that it was actually not safe to do because this area now is entirely covered with trees, with kudzu, with brambles. Uh, underneath these kudzu and brambles, it is loaded with rattlesnakes, moccasins, coral snakes, and ticks. And that it's to venture in there is almost to put your life at risk. And I, well, I'd like to get a brick from this place. I'm not that desperate to get a brick from it. The, the people in these factories in Georgia, they will be uh, marched off. The ones from Roswell, 1,200. Women will be placed on trains sent to the north and to Indiana. They will disappear. They have never, for the most part, never been heard from since. Out of the 1,200 women, about six of those women ever made their way back to their homes in Roswell, Georgia, after the war. New Manchester was different. It was a uh, different army officer who came to hit this town, and he made them an offer that they couldn't refuse. He says, okay. Here's what the deal is. If you will sign your parole, remember these are civilian workers, not soldiers. You will sign your parole saying that you will not work for the Confederate government for the rest of the war. I will not take you. I will leave you here. I'll open up the company warehouse because there was a commissary there that provided the workers with food and stuff. You can take the food. You can live in the uh, houses that the company provides. I only ask that you do not lift a hand to help the Confederacy for the rest of the war. About 1,000 people took advantage of that. About 250 said no, and they went north with the uh, 
people from Roswell than like uh, the ones in Roswell have never been heard from since. This is documented, okay? It's documented in the official records of the Civil War. This is not some kind of a story that has been made up. So it's true. So let's here again just an inside shot of what one of these mules look like. So let's move on to teachers now, okay? In 1860, 25% of all teachers are women. Now the war's in, uh, two-thirds of all teachers will be women, and the achievement of women teachers is going to establish the foundation of the profession of teaching today in the United States. It is difficult to locate pay data for teachers, but we know it was probably low probably based on the number of students they taught. And the one anecdotal reference I can find is to a teacher, lady teacher, who taught 12 students and was paid 50 cents per month per student, which gave her a $6 a month income. And actually, that's probably a fairly good income when you look at some that we're going to look at here in just a moment. Okay. Uh, the other large group we mentioned earlier were civil service workers. Uh, all kinds of figures are hard to get about the Civil War, you know, with women and employment. Uh, there are a number of books out about women in the Civil War, but they really don't discuss these topics. They don't discuss the topic of pay, types of jobs they did, working conditions, or what have you. It's just sort of like they're mentioned, and that's it. Uh, Federal, state, and local and businesses uh, discover that women as employees are make good employees. They start off basically as clerks, bookkeepers, stenographers, receptionists. And when foreign travelers visit Washington, D.C., where there are numerous uh, women, which I guess would have been probably called girls, there are numerous girls working for the government, and they're intrigued by what are called government girls. I worked in Washington, D.C. in 1963. I can only tell you that a huge number of women that were working there, most of them young girls, they were recruited from all over the United States to go to Washington for work. Indeed, the federal government leased a hotel. These girls, when they would arrive in Washington, D.C., would be put up there for a couple of months where they would meet other young girls, match up in little groups, and go out and rent themselves apart. And that was like a shark breeding ground. I mean, they were like chum thrown out to attract us young men. <laughs> okay. Government employment is going to be very precarious at any time in the early, in most of the 1800s because of the winner-take-all political appointments. Vir virtually every job, whether you were a janitor or the postmaster, was a political job and uh, subject to political appointment. There was no civil service. We had a civil service of sorts prior to the election of Andrew Jackson. We had a very well-trained civil service corps, and one of the first things that Andrew Jackson did was to abolish civil service and he replaced it with political appointees, uh, winner take all. And you can recall stories of Abraham Lincoln in his early days of his presidency uh, having to face mobs of job seekers every day for every, every type of job imaginable in the federal government was up for grabs. First civil service protections are going to be limited and they won't come along until the 1880s. And one of my relatives, a gentleman named Theodore Roosevelt, early in his career served as one of the first civil service commissioners. After the war, General President Grant will appoint more than 200 women as federal postmasters. And we're going to talk about two of them here. One is the wife of uh, Armistead Long, who was a colonel in the Confederate Army, who had only one arm at this time. His wife was given a, an appointment as the federal postmaster in her town. And the other uh, was the appointment of Emma Van Loo, 
And for those of you who've uh, sat through my presentation on women spies of the Civil War, you'll remember her name as being the Union spy master in Richmond, Virginia during the war. Her job lasted as long as uh, Grant was president. When a new president came in, it was nothing personal. She was let go. She ended up working in the post office, however, as a postal employee for the rest of her life, but not as a postmaster. Uh, by 1890, there are going to be more than 1,100 women who are working at the Census Bureau. And you had to take a math test to get a job there. We're finally getting to the point in time where, you know, there's some of the civil service rules and there's some standards that you have to meet to get a job. And more than half of these women, that would be about 550 of these women, score higher than 85% on the math exam. Maybe we're fortunate they don't say what the men scored. Okay. Kind of in wrapping up, we're going to take a look here at the economy during the Civil War. And like all wars, the rich get rich. This is not just to pick on Civil War rich, but uh, pretty much in every war, people make money off of war. Uh, there are huge contracts that are let. We talked about in the Civil War. DuPont Incorporated having a contract to provide gunpowder. And I'm sure they made a lot of money making that gunpowder for them. Uh, AT&T actually was a corporation back then, too, which made money. <laughs> war profiteering is going to be common. It's common in every single war. People make unholy profits from war. Union manufacturers are going to double and triple the amount of dividends that they pay during the war. Uh, the newly rich are going to build lavish homes, acquire carriages, silk clothing, and jewelry. And there's going to be a public outrage that such conduct is unbecoming and even immoral during the war. However, I don't know that most people did much about it. So we're going to come to what I call the two percenters. And we have two percenters today who are in our country who are willing to uh, crash our country into the ground uh, as long as they get their, uh, their wealth. Yeah. Here are some of the uh, folks that are a part of the two percenters. And notice the uh, elaborate uh, dresses that these women are wearing. And they are making gloves and uh, uh, socks for soldiers in the Army. And this is a very early on photograph. This was taken in June of 1861. So they're out, they're doing their patriotic duty. But again, these are among the two percent, the upper elites of the country. So let's take a look now at the 98%, what I call the 98 percenters. Well, their salaries are going to shrink in real terms due to inflation. Okay? Uh, along with uh, wars and people making obscene profits also comes inflation, uh, which will usually hurt the uh, lower end of the spectrum. Prices of beef, rice, and sugar are going to double from pre-war levels. Salaries are going to rise only half as fast as prices. And these are all standard things that go with war. During, during World War II, we kind of had ways to control that. We had the OPA, the Office of Price Administration, which determined, the federal government determined what you could charge for something. So. These were somewhat minimized in World War II, but uh, they had not, they didn't have these uh, political establishments in the Civil War. And here's a photograph of uh, what I refer to as the 98 percenters, all the rest of us, the mill girls, for example. And we're going to look here at uh, the textile workers. Uh, now, Seamstresses would be kind of a subcategory of textile workers. And textile workers I look at not primarily as those working in factories making the cloth. Seamstresses would be the people who do something with the cloth after it's made. 1861, they're getting 17 and a half cent per shirt that they make. By 1864, their salary has been cut to 15 cents per shirt. And that's at the year that the inflation is at the highest. By 1865, they're down to $0.08 cents per shirt. And by the end of the war, 
Many seamstresses are making a dollar and fifty-four cents per week. Remember, I said that uh, school teacher example that we I gave you. She was making about six dollars a week, so she's making about four times what these seamstresses would make. In the textile workers, the mill girls in the north, men are making four to six dollars a week. Women are making two dollars a week, and out of that, they have to pay a dollar fifty cents a week board. So they end up with 50 cents a week for disposable income. And children are going to make 50 cents to a dollar a week. For the textile workers and mill girls in the South, precise salaries are not available for the first half of the war. Inflation started in very early in the South, and it's just not possible to track down at this point in time what some of those salaries were. In the second half of the war, women were often paid in kind, and in, in kind being they were just simply given a bag of grits or a bag of rice or a bag of whatever, or a bag of sugar, rather than cash money for food. And they probably preferred this because uh, the inflation was so bad, it would, by the time they could get to the store to spend it, it would be out of date. Okay, the Postal Department, okay. In the Dead Letter Office in Washington, D.C., there are 32 employees. I guess because they had a lot of dead letters, because they had a lot of dead soldiers, perhaps. And in October 1863, males are making $540 to $945 a year. Women are making $400 to $700 a year. By 1865, they've consolidated the salaries into one band. Males, 900. Females, 600. Females are getting two-thirds of what a male gets. And then by 1870, they've uh, come up with a kind of a preliminary uh, classification system on jobs, which you'll see the civil service will develop. And males, class one, the lowest, get $1,200 a year. And females, class one, get $900 a year, which would be 75%. So they're a little further along, but uh, still way less. Nurses, the poor nurses, there are over 4,000 nurses serve in the Civil War, and they are paid zero. Now, they do get a lot of things in kind. For instance, the armies that they're serving with will usually provide them with their meals, that will usually provide them with shelter, uh, will provide them with transportation when, as the army moves, but as an actual salary, they are not paid at all, the ones for the federal government. So, so in conclusion, you know, the economic emancipation of women is going to be the most important single factor in her social, intellectual, and political advancement. And the Civil War did more than four years to change her economic status than had been done in any preceding generation. And that is, really is the truth. That First of all, it put women into various positions. Uh, more in the public, it got them out of their homes and out of the shelter and the shadow of the household and into the public sphere. It also gave women the chance to demonstrate their skills. And after the war, after the immediate demobilization, women uh, returned to this workforce and remained a viable economic part of it. And that concludes my presentation on Rosie the Riveter Civil War style. Thank you.